Okay, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to continue talking about null spaces and ranges, but let me just remind you that last time we defined the null space of a linear transformation, of a linear map. It's just all the vectors that get mapped to zero. That's the null space. And it's a, it's a subspace. And we saw the following examples, right? So if you take the zero map, then the null space is everything. If you take the identity map, the, the null space is just the zero vector. If you take this differentiation map, then the null space, those are the constant polynomials, right? So depending on the linear map that you choose, uh, the null space might be big. It could be everything, right? It might be very small. It might be just the zero vector. Uh, it turns out that you can use the null space to try to understand when a linear map is injective. Okay, so I know you saw the definition of injective in uh, 308 and in 300, although maybe it was called one to one. So let's just define it here. So this definition applies to any function, not just a linear map. So a function is called injective. if uh, tu equals tv implies u equals v. Okay, or the contrapositive, so equivalently, if u not equal to v implies that tu is not equal to tv. Okay, in other words, uh, injective functions, they map distinct inputs to distinct outputs. All right, what this says is that uh, if you have two different inputs, they're not equal, then the outputs must be different. Right? So to be injective means that you never send two different things to the same thing. Like I said, in Math 308, you probably learned the word one-to-one uh, -to, -one to describe this. Uh, I will always use injective because that's the term that I use in everyday life. Right? Of course, my everyday life is as a mathematician, but <laughs> we're going to use the word injective. Okay, and like I said, you can use the null space to detect whether or not a, a linear map is injective. So if you have a linear map t from a vector space b to a vector space w, then t is injective uh, if and only if the null space of t consists of just the zero vector. OK, so this is a sort of a, an easy criterion to check whether or not a function is injective, assuming it's a linear map. OK, and I should say that so th this does require right? this hypothesis that your linear map uh, is important. Certainly, uh, this direction must be true for every function. I mean, if t is just a function, if it's injective, then it's null. OK, so I mean, the word null space doesn't quite make sense for a general function. But if you have a, a linear map, the null space is all the stuff that gets sent to 0. But if it's injective, it's not allowed to send more than one thing to 0, because right? otherwise that would fail to be injective. And since it's a linear map, it has to be, I mean, it has to send 0 to 0, which means the only thing it sends to 0 is the 0 vector. OK, so this direction is sort of obvious just from the fact that it's a function, essentially. It's the reverse direction that really uses the fact that t is, is a linear map, right? that there's some more nice structure to it. Right? So what this says is, in general, if you just have a general function, if you want to check if it's injective, you need to make sure that for every single output, there's at, at most one input that maps over to it. right? But for a linear map, you only need to check what, what gets mapped to 0. Once you know that only one thing gets mapped to 0, you don't need to check any, anything else about it. It's automatically injective. OK, and the proof is. Uh, So I sort of walk, I sort of talk through the proof of the forward direction, right? So let's do the reverse direction, which is sort of the non-obvious direction. So suppose that the null space of t is equal to just the zero vector and t is a linear map. We want to show that t is injective, right? Okay, well, to show that t is injective, uh, you use the definition. Right, so we could use either uh, 
tu equals tv and then see if that implies that u equals v or take u not equal to v uh, and show that tu does not equal to tv. Okay, but I think actually the this first part, this first definition is the nicer one to work with because it actually, saying that two vectors are equal is a very strong statement. So you get to start with something stronger. Saying that two vectors aren't equal is not a very strong statement. Okay, so now uh, suppose that there's two vectors u and v such that tu is equal to tv. I just need to prove that u equals v. Well, I'm assuming something about the null space of t. So I want to try to find something that t maps to 0. Right, But if you just subtract these things, right, these two things were equal. So t minus tv is 0. And since t is linear, so this is where we use the linearity of t, this is the same thing as t of u minus v. Right, so this means that u minus v is in the null space because it gets mapped to 0. But the null space is just 0. So that means that u minus v equals 0, which implies that u equals v. Therefore, we started with assuming that tu equals tv. We concluded that u equals v. So by definition, uh, t is injective. OK, so I mean, even this direction is not particularly complex. It's not like a, a very fancy involved proof. I just want to point out that this direction was the non-obvious direction where you actually need to use the linearity of t. OK. Uh, so this section is called null spaces and ranges. So now we're going to talk about ranges. Again, I'll define it. Um, I'll give you some basic propositions, some basic examples. So this word range or image, uh, that parenthesis should be here, uh, of a function. So this definition, again, applies to any function, not just a linear map. But in this class, basically, almost every function is going to be a linear map anyway. But what is the range? The range of t, we denote it like this. It's the set of all vectors w and w such that w equals tv for some v and v. OK, you could also write it like this. It's the set of all tv as v, v ranges in v. This is the same thing. Okay, wh what is this? This is just all of the vectors that actually occur as an output of t. Right, so a general function from one set to another, you don't have to hit everything in the codomain. Right? It's possible that your function just misses some things in w. But the, the set of objects that t actually hits, that's called the range. OK, so just remark, uh, the, right, the null space, so if t is a function from v to w, the null space of t this is all the inputs that get mapped to 0. This was we saw was a subspace of v. But the range of t, all things that get hit, this is naturally a sub, at least a subset of w. Okay, so the null space and the range live in different places if v and w are different. Uh, but now we have a subset of a vector space. The question you should ask is, is this a subspace? Right? The null space was a subspace. The range is also a subspace. So if t is a linear map from v to w, then the range of t is a subspace of w. OK, so let me give you a brief proof. How do you show if something is a subspace? You need to show that it contains 0, it's closed under addition, it's closed under scale multiplication. So does it contain 0? Well, that's just asking, is 0 in the output of t? But we saw that if you input t, if you input 0 into t, you get 0. right? So since t of 0 equals 0, this means that 0 is in the range. It actually occurs as an output. Okay. Uh, the next thing you should check is that it's closed under 
addition. So what you do is you just take two vectors from the range. Uh, OK, I guess I want to use some W letters because these things are in W, just to remind you. I need to show that W1 plus W2 is in the range. Well, since these vectors are in the range, what that means is that they occur as outputs right, of t. So this means that there exist v1 and v2 in v, such that tv1 equals w1 and tv2 equals w2. So how can I get w1 plus w2 as an output? Well, I should just add these two vectors. Right? So t applied to v1 plus v2. Since t is linear, this is tv1 plus tv2, which is w1 plus w2. So therefore, w1 plus w2 is an output of this function. This shows that w1 plus w2 is in the range of t. Okay, and scalar multiplication is similar. Uh, I'll let you do that. Yeah, but I mean, I can walk you through it. You don't need to be walked through it, I'm sure. You just suppose that you have a w in the range. You need to show that lambda w is in the range for any scalar lambda. Well, since w is in the range, you can find a little v such that t of v equals w. To get lambda w, you just take lambda v, right? And you use the linearity of t. OK, so the range is also a subspace, except it's of the codomain. I guess we should look at a bunch of examples. Probably just the same examples from last time, I guess. So the zero map, I think that was our first one. I don't remember if I numbered these. Right? Again, the zero map uh, just maps every single vector to zero. So no matter what w is, uh, the only thing that ever pops out of the function is the zero vector. So the range of t is just the subspace consisting of just the zero vector as a, I mean, this is a subspace of w, just to remind you which, uh, which zero this is. A2 is the identity map. Uh, I from the subspace V to itself. What does this vector do? It just, once you plug in a vector, it just spits out the same vector, which means that everything gets hit. If you want to get a vector V as an output, you just plug that vector V in as an input. The identity map spits it out as an output. So the range of the identity map is everything. This is, I mean, it feels stupid to write this. Uh, here, v is both the domain and the codomain, but the range is everything. OK, so those are the, sort of the first two trivial examples. Let's think of some more interesting examples. So again, let's think of differentiation uh, as a map from the polynomials to the polynomials. So the question is, What's the range of this map? Another way of saying that is, what are the possible outputs? So what outputs can you possibly get as a derivative? The answer is, every polynomial occurs as a derivative. Right? Uh, so if you have an arbitrary polynomial, something like this, then we know that this has a polynomial antiderivative. Right, so this is the derivative of a zero z plus, uh, I guess, a one over two z squared plus a two over three z cubed plus a n over n plus one z to the n plus one. So no matter what polynomial you want, it is the derivative of some polynomial. Uh, so the range of d is again, everything. OK, so maybe you should also think about what if we, instead of considering the differentiation map from every polynomial to every polynomial, I mean, from instead of all polynomials to instead of all polynomials, you could consider it, right? So this is, you should think about this. You could also consider it as a map from maybe polynomials of degree less than or equal to three to polynomials of degree less than or equal to three. 
right? or even as an element of polynomials of degree less than or equal to three to all polynomials, right? Uh, how many parentheses? Okay. And then, well, the rule is sort of the same, but the domain, I'm changing the domain and the codomain here. So you can think about the null space and the range of uh, the differentiation maps in these two cases. Okay, fourth example. Uh, I think this was the left shift one, right? So the left shift from f infinity to f infinity. Right, so what does it do? It just shifts, shifts the whole vector to the left. Uh, well, what is the range of this thing? What vectors can you possibly get as left shifts? Uh, the answer is again, everything, right? If I want to get a vector as an output, I just could take zero and then list that vector afterward, right? So the range of this thing is all of F infinity, but in this case, uh, maybe the more interesting one, it's the right shift. It's not that interesting, but right. So for the, if you shift right, the kinds of vectors you can get out is they have to start with zero, but then the rest of the entries could be everything, could be anything, I should say. Right, so the range of R, it's a set of vectors that look like this, zero, then anything, then anything, then anything, where all the AIs are scalars. Okay, and then, uh, uh, I guess last time I also had an example. Ah, uh, yeah, let me find it in my notes. Okay. We had a linear transformation T from F3 uh, to F2, given by T of X, Y, Z equals X plus Y, 2Z. Right? So what is the range of this thing? Well, the range is, I mean, the, the sort of the easiest way to say it is it's just all the vectors of the form x plus y, 2z, where x, y, and z are just uh, entries in the field. But every single vector can be written in this form, right? This is all of F2. Why is that? Well, if I want, let's say I want to get the vector AB. How do I get it as an output? Well, the first vector should be, I mean, the first coordinate is just the sum of the first two coordinates of the input. So I could do something like A comma zero, B over two. All right, so I can get any vector I want as an output. So the range is actually everything. And probably if someone asks you for the range, right? If you tell them this, I guess you're, techni you're technically correct, but not helpful, right? Okay, and uh, two things. One thing is uh, given a linear transformation like this, actually given by uh, some concrete function, you learned in math 308 how to compute the range, actually, which we will discuss just as a refresher. The second thing is just like for the null space, the range could be uh, as small as possible or as big as possible or sort of anything in between, right? So the zero map has the smallest possible range. The identity map has the biggest possible range. but we have a special word for functions that have as big a range as possible, which you sort of, I know you already know, but let's just make this definition. Uh, a function t from b to w is called surjective if 
the range of t equals w. Okay, so in math 308, you use the word onto for a surjective map. But the idea is a surjective map actually hits everything in the codomain because the range is everything. Okay. Now, one thing that uh, we can think about here is that there is a, there's sort of some sort of relationship, although it's not like a very, it's not that easy to see what it is, but there's some relationship between the null space of a, of a linear map and the, the range of a linear map, right? So why do I say it's not that easy to, to sort of see what it is? Well, these two things live in different spaces, right? The null space lives in the domain, the range lives in the codomain. So how could these things be related? Well, these things are related uh, in terms of their size. So the basic idea is this. If the null space is big, it means that you're sending a lot of vectors to zero, which somehow means that you can't be hitting that much stuff in the codomain. On the other hand, if the codomain is big, it means that your linear map is hitting a lot of vectors in in the codomain, you must not be sending very much stuff to zero. Okay, so this is just uh, this is a vague statement, but it's the way. I mean, it's why you should expect that there's some relationship between the size of the range and the size of the null space, even though there is subspaces living in different vector spaces. And the precise relationship is what. I learned as being called the rank nullity theorem. Uh, so that's a, the phrasing I prefer. Although I guess your book has not yet defined the word rank or nullity. So maybe that's the reason why your book calls it the fundamental theorem of linear maps. Um, does it deserve to be called the fundamental theorem of linear maps? Maybe. <laughs> what does it say? So here, uh, now this definition, I mean, this theorem only holds for V a finite dimensional vector space. So suppose V is finite dimensional. Everything else in this lecture, uh, we weren't assuming anything about V and W. In particular, we were assuming they were finite dimensional. Here, I'll assume that V is finite dimensional, and I'll assume that T is a linear map from V to W. Okay, so note, I'm not making any assumption on the finite dimensionality of W. Okay, but if V is finite dimensional and you have a linear map from V, regardless of what W is, the range of T is finite dimensional. So if you're starting from a finite dimensional thing, you can only sort of hit finite dimensionally many vectors. And uh, the dimension of the domain V is the same thing as the dimension of the null space plus the dimension of the range. Okay, so this is capturing the idea that the bigger the null space gets, the smaller the range has to be. The smaller the null space gets, the bigger the range has to be. And they should add up to exactly the dimension of the domain. Okay, so in like 308, this was called the nullity. Actually, it was only defined for a matrix, right? And this was called the rank. It was only defined for a matrix. And the standard proof in 308, I think, just uses something about pivots and matrices. Uh, but that's like a, that's like a barbaric proof because you're using some matrix representation. Uh, when this is a statement about linear maps. Uh, another thing is that if you try to do this proof using this matrix representation, then it will only work for, um, I mean, if, you, if you're going to write down a matrix, then V has to be Fn and W has to be Fm. So that the proof using matrices 
there you need w to be finite dimensional as well. Because if w is infinite dimensional, there's no hope of writing down a matrix. A matrix is a finite rectangular array of numbers. So that's why that proof is barbaric. We should prove this using just some intrinsic properties of the maps. Uh, so we will. I don't know, maybe, if you're, maybe for like an applied person or like a CS person, it's not that barbaric. But if you're, if you're a mathematics person, it seems kind of barbaric. Okay. Now, since null t, the null space is a subspace of a finite dimensional vector space. Uh, every subspace of a finite dimensional vector space is finite dimensional. This is by a theorem. Okay. Anytime you make a, an assertion, you should know why it's true. So it has a basis because we proved that every finite dimensional vector space has a basis. So let's call the basis uh, u1 up through um. Okay, we also have a theorem that says that you can start with any linearly independent list in a vector space and extend it to a basis of the whole vector space. So these vectors are in the null space, right? They're bases of the null space, but they're also in V. So we can extend this by a theorem to a basis of V. So we start with U1 up through UM, and then we maybe add some V1 up through VN. So this is a basis of V. OK, so since this is a basis of V, this means that the dimension of V is M plus N. Okay, so in order to prove this theorem, I just need to prove that the range is finite dimensional of dimension n, right? That would, that would achieve, the, achieve the theorem. So we need to show that t is finite dimensional of dimension n. Okay, so. In order to do that, then I need a basis for the range. Okay, so where can we possibly get a basis for the range of t? And as a bonus, hopefully it should have length n. Well, here's a list of n vectors, but they're living in the wrong vector space. They're living in v. A basis of the range should be living in w. So I contend that the only thing to possibly try is you map these over to w under t. So we will show that tv1 up through tvn is a basis of the range of t. Okay, so if we do that, then we'll have shown that range of t is finite dimensional and its basis has length n, so it has dimension n. Okay, and again, let me point out, this is the only possible thing we could have tried. OK, so I just need to show that these vectors are linearly independent, and they span the range. OK. So I need to show that this list is linearly independent and spans range. Okay, but let me just make a note here that, so observe, given any V and V, uh, since we have a basis of V, we can write V in a unique way as a linear combination of these vectors, right? So V equals, maybe I'll call the, the coefficients on the U's A's and the coefficients on the V's B's. So if we start with a vector like this, what happens when we plug it into t? Well, what you'll get is you'll get t of this plus t of this, right? But this first part, this is in the null space, right? So t of that will be 0. So what you'll get in the end, applying the linearity of t, is you'll get this linear combination of the t of these 
Okay, so I've done a couple of steps here. Well, what does this mean? V was an arbitrary vector in V. That means that TV here is an arbitrary vector in the range, right? This is just every, every possible output looks like this. And these things are in the span of the TV1 up there, TVN, right? So this means that these vectors span the range of T. Every possible output you can write as a linear combination of these guys. Okay, I just need to show linear independence. So now for linear independence, right? So how do you show that vectors are linearly independent? You suppose that you have a linear combination which equals zero. And you, then you need to show that the coefficients all have to be zero. Okay, well, the only information I have about these Vs is that they're part of a basis of capital V, right? So the, the control I have on these Vs is back in the domain, right? This equation right now is happening in the range, right? So this is happening in W. I want to understand something about the Vs, but I understand them in V. This means that I should sort of pull them back along T, try to understand what this means in V, right? So what I'm starting to say here is this means that if we sort of undo the linearity This means that this vector, which is now a vector in V, gets mapped to zero, which means that this vector is in the null space of T. Right? So I've now successfully gotten some information about these coefficients, except now it's back in the domain where I have control over these vectors. Okay, well, if it's in the null space, that means that it's a linear combination of the U's. Right? So since it's the U's span uh, the null space, this vector is some linear combination uh, of the U's. Okay, but now let's just subtract. Okay, so instead of writing that those two things were equal, let me subtract these vectors. Probably should have just rewritten this. Okay, but now the V's and the U's, these are linearly independent because they form a basis of V. This is a linear combination which equals zero. This means that all of these coefficients must be zero. So all the CIs and DJs are all zero. So I started with an arbitrary linear combination of these vectors, which equaled zero. I showed that all the coefficients must be zero. This means that this list is linearly independent, which therefore shows, since they also spanned, that these form a basis for the range, which means that the range is finite dimensional of dimension n, which means that when you add up together the dimension of the null space plus the dimension of the range, you get the dimension of V, which is the rank nullity theorem. Okay, man, I really wanna ask, are there any questions? So if at this point in the video, you have some questions, feel free to send me an email right now and ask me that question. Okay, so now let me give you two Two results. I'll only prove one of them because the proof of the other one is sort of exactly the same and you should do it, uh, which are immediate corollaries, I would say, of the rank nullity theorem or the fundamental theorem of linear maps. Uh, what are these theorems? So here in both these theorems, we'll suppose that both V and W are both finite dimensional. 
such that the dimension of W, sorry, the dimension of V, that's the first one, is bigger than the dimension of W. Okay, what does this say? This is saying that V is bigger than W in this dimension sense. If you have a map from a bigger space to a smaller space, what can you expect out of that map? That map might be surjective, right? If the codomain is smaller than the domain, you might be surjective, you might not be. However, that map can never be injective. All right, so this says if your domain is too big, you can't get an injective map. Okay, the corresponding proposition, it's okay, so it's suppose V and W are finite dimensional, such that dimension of V is less than dimension of W. So now the strictly less, now the domain is smaller than the codomain. Right? If the domain is smaller than the codomain, you might be injective. Right? There's sort of enough room in W to hold all the vectors in V. You might not be. However, if the do domain is smaller than codomain, you have no chance of hitting everything. Right? So the statement of this is the no linear map V to W is surjective. Okay, and uh, in 300, you learned the set theoretic version of this result, which is if A is a bigger set than B and they're both finite sets, then no map from A to B is injective if A is bigger than B and no map from A to B is surjective if A is smaller than B. Uh, but the point is, is that these results, which seem very reasonable, it seems like these things should be true, uh, you can prove, well, one way to prove them is to use the rank nullity theorem. So let me just prove the first one. Or maybe I can just, yeah, let me just prove the first one. And then you can prove the second one. So let T be a linear map between two finite dimensional vector spaces. Well, I'm interested in showing that this map can never be injective, which by a result from earlier today means I just need to look at, is the null space just the zero vector or not? So I'm interested in the null space, right? The null space of T. I said that this was a corollary of the rank nullity theorem. The rank nullity theorem says that the dimension of the null space is equal to the dimension of V minus the dimension of the range. So this is the dimension of this, this guy is the dimension of V minus the dimension of the range of T. Right, this is by uh, the rank nullity theorem or the fundamental theorem of uh, linear maps. Okay, so somehow I wanna prove that this number is too big to be just a zero vector and therefore the map is not injective. Okay, but uh, the range of T, this thing is a subspace of W. So it, ha so it has dimension less than or equal to the dimension of W. Which means that this number I'm, is bigger than or equal to the dimension of V minus the dimension of W. Okay, this is because uh, subspaces have smaller dimension, smaller than or equal to. Right, this I guess we proved because you can extend every basis of a subspace to a basis of the, the whole space. That's one way to do it. And then since we assume that dimension of V is strictly greater than dimension of W, this thing is strictly bigger than zero. Therefore, showing that the null space has positive dimension, which means that it can't just be the zero vector. So by that result from earlier today, well, this means the null space is not just the zero vector. So by that theorem, T is not injective. And then you do a similar thing for the, for the surjective thing. Okay, so I wanna take uh, the last 20 minutes or so. I'm not sure if it'll take 20 minutes. Uh, just to refresh all of our memories 
about how to make some computations with matrices because the next section in your textbook, the next what we'll cover on Friday, uh, is on the matrix of a linear map. So this is just uh, recall matrices. OK, because so maybe I bad mouth matrices a little bit earlier in this lecture, calling them maybe right, a little bit barbaric to work with. On the other hand, if you have some actual linear maps that you actually want to compute with, you basically always do it with a matrix. OK, so even, even mathematicians, if they want to understand concretely what a map does, not in the abstract, a linear map, they'll write down a matrix and try to understand the matrix. So I just want to jog your memory about some things about matrices. OK, so there are at least two ways to describe subspaces of Rn. OK, so I'll say Rn. This is true for Fn, too. So at least. Okay, so one way is implicitly. Uh, let me give you an example. So you consider the set of solutions. Let's be very specific. X in R4 to the system of equations can be very specific here. I'll write down an actual system of equations. Two x one plus six x two plus nine x three plus seven x four equals zero. Negative x one minus three x two plus three x three plus four x four equals zero. Okay, so the solution set to a homogeneous system of linear equations you may remember is a subspace. And the point is that some of these some vectors in R four, right? You can choose some x1, x2, x3, x4 that will satisfy the system of equations. Since it's homogeneous, there will always be, at least if you choose them all to be zero, corresponding to the zero vector, you get a solution. But there may be more. So this represents some subspace of R4. Or, right, so I say implicitly because. I'm not, tell, I'm not actually telling you here what vectors are in the subspace at all, right? To find the vectors in the subspace, somehow you need to solve the system of equations. So this is an implicit definition of a subspace. Or I could give them to you more explicitly. So I could say, oh, well, take the span of some vectors. So here, what I'm doing, how am I getting these vectors? I'm just taking the coefficients uh, from the system of equations above. Right, and I should say that this thing is a subspace of R3. Right. Now it's like I'm telling you, oh, just take every possible linear combination of these vectors. That's a subspace. OK, and maybe it's not so hard to believe that if you present them implicitly like this, this it's sort of easy to see is the null space of some map. Right? Why, why do I say it's easy to see? Because it's about something equaling zero, right? And this, uh, you can also express as the range of some linear, linear map. Here, I mean the same linear map, where t is a map from uh, r4 to r3. OK, in particular, it's the one associated to the matrix that you want to write down, this one. Right, so how is this matrix related to some linear map? Well, maybe something that you remember is, OK, so this thing this matrix A, you can 
define a linear map from R4 to R3, where the linear map takes a vector in R4 and just multiplies on the left by this matrix. And a uh, theorem from math 308 is that this first vector is just the image of the first standard basis vector. Right, that's actually pretty clear if you just multiply this by 1, 0, 0, 0, what you get is exactly the first column. So the way that given a map, the way that you get the columns to this matrix are you just take the images of the standard basis vectors in the domain and you put them as the columns of the matrix. Okay, but note uh, every vector in R4 can be written in terms of these standard basis vectors. So if you have some vector x that looks like x1, x2, x3, x4, this is the same thing as x1, e1 plus x2, e2 plus x3, e3 plus x4, e4. And so if you apply t of x to this x, that's the same thing as a times this vector x. Uh, but since t is linear transformation and multiplication by a matrix is a linear thing, this thing will be x1 t of e1 plus x2 t of e2 plus xn t of en, right? If, if you apply t to this thing and use the linearity of t, which is x1 times 1, 2, negative 1, plus x2 times 3, 6, negative 3, plus x3 times 3, 9, 3, plus x4 times 2, 7, 4. Right, and this was the definition of how to multiply this matrix by this vector. You take a linear combination of the columns of the matrix with coefficients coming from the vector. Okay, and then saying that this equaled zero, for example, is exactly saying that it, you have a solution to this system of equations. Okay, so this is all computational stuff you learned in 308. I'm just trying to jog your memory. So I'm not explaining things fully, of course. Uh, but the key tool, and this I know you remember, uh, if you have a matrix, the key tool is Gaussian elimination. Right, so uh, let me just remind you of how to find a basis for um, the null space in the range. So what you do is you write down this matrix, this very important matrix for this linear map. Again, for any linear map, T, if you know what it does to the standard basis vectors, you plug in this the columns of the matrix, you get a matrix like this. And then you do some row reductions, right? So you subtract two of the first row from the second row, for example. You get 0, 0, 3, 3. And you add the first row to the third row. You get 0, 0, 6, 6. And then you proceed, right? So now you can divide the first, the second row by, by 3. And you can subtract that from, I mean, you can subtract six of those from the, the third row. And then let's go to reduced row echelon form. So you can subtract three of the second row. Let's call this matrix U, right? So this thing is the reduced row echelon form of A. Okay, and once you've done this process, you can read off information about the null space and the range of T because they're the null space and the range of the matrix A. In particular, the null space of T is the same thing as the null space of this matrix A. And a thing that you actually learned, maybe showed even in 308, is that that's the same thing as the null space of this matrix U. Right, so it's all the vectors X such that AX equals zero, but it's also all the vectors x such that ux equals zero. So doing row operations uh, does not does not change the, the null space of the matrix. Okay, and from the matrix u, it's easy to read off a basis for the null space. 
what you do, you look at the pivot variables, you look at the free variables, the free variables are free. So uh, x4 is a free variable, right? x4 is free. Then this second row says that x3 equals negative x4. x2 is free. And the first row says that x1 equals negative 3x2 plus x4. Right, so this is saying that any solution to ux equals 0, x2 and x4 can be anything you want, and x1 and x3 have to be whatever in here. Right, so the solutions here are, all look like vectors where x1 is negative 3x2 plus x4, x2 is just x2, x3 is negative x4, where here x2 and x4 are just any real numbers. And this you can break up uh, like this. There's an x2 component, negative 3, 1, 0, 0. There's an x4 component, 1, 0, negative 1, 1, as x2 and x4 range over all possible scalars. And so a basis for the null space, these two vectors give you a basis for the null space. Okay, so given an actual linear transformation, if you want to understand the null space in general, you write down the matrix by plugging in the standard basis vectors. You row reduce the matrix. You read off the solutions. This gives you a basis for the null space. OK, what about the range? Uh, the range of t ends up being the same thing as what you call the column space of A. So it's the span of the columns. OK, and then again, a fact that you learned in 308 is that if you look at the pivot columns in the original matrix, these are a basis for the column space. OK, so this has basis given by the, columns, the, the pivot columns in your original matrix. OK, so even so the, again, the, the range is exactly the span of these four vectors. But these four vectors aren't linearly independent, so you actually don't need all of them. So for example, I mean, right, if this, this, this were a basis, then this thing would have dimension four, which we know is nonsense because it lives in a vector space of dimension three. In fact, uh, we actually know that it has to have dimension two, right? Because the null space has dimension two. And the null space, dimension of the null space plus dimension of the range should add up to the dimension of the domain, which was R4. I mean, so it has dimension four. So we know that it had to have a two-dimensional column space. But what you do, again, given any linear map T, if you want to understand concretely the range, you write down the matrix by plugging in the standard basis vectors. You row reduce the matrix. You find the pivot columns in the original matrix. That gives you a basis for. Um, the range of that linear transformation. OK, so these last two slides should be review. But it's likely that you forgot some of these things, uh, whether you took 308 last quarter or last year, or right, things fall out of your head. So the next section is on the matrix of a linear transformation, 3C. So I just want to remind you of what you learned in 308. All right, so Friday, like I said, we'll talk about 3C. And then I think on Monday, uh, I think section or chapter three ends with section C. So I, nope, that's, that's a lie. On Monday, we'll talk about 3D on invertible. Oh, there's actually, there's a lot of sections, okay. Uh, we'll spend next week also talking about chapter three. All right. See you in office hours if you ever come by.